and we'll start recording from the current slide. But before we get into this, let me make this one last announcement. Uh, actually, two. I think I've been warning you or telling you for a couple of weeks now that after the midterm, which was two weeks ago now almost, that the college calendar said midterm progress reports due that next week. Well, that next week came and went, and they never opened the midterm progress reports. So, as far as I know, no one did them. And then, finally, the dean realized that, and she said, Oh, please do your midterm progress reports. So, I've had to do that. Now, preaching through the choir here, you, you know, done well. But, it's generally the people who are not here are the ones who haven't turned in work. And by not turning in work, I had to give them outs at midterm because I didn't have any grades for them. So, just a word to the wise, if you start getting phone calls from or emails from counselors or tutors or things like this, asking if you need help, don't think poorly of them. And it's not hurting you in any way, but it is sort of a reminder, get something in, okay? They don't know why you have an F at midterm. You and I know why you have an F at midterm. You either... Well, you haven't turned anything in, and most of the reason for that is you're not here very much. Okay, so please get stuff turned in. All right, any questions or anything? Oh, and the other thing is, it doesn't impact this class any, but it may impact, because you have all your classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, right? Um, there is a faculty... What's that? Oh, I see. Okay. There is a uh, faculty staff meeting this afternoon. I think from 2.30 to 4.30 or something like that, across there in the best, uh, Ethel Hall Auditorium. However, um, if you've got an instructor who is an adjunct instructor, they aren't required to be there, so more than likely your class will meet as scheduled. If you have a full-time instructor, it may or may not be meeting as scheduled, so what my suggestion is, is to get the... Uh, uh, Aaliyah's here. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear. Oh man! Well, I was just saying before um, that they did finally open up and say we had to report midterm progress reports. So I had to do reports for people who hadn't turned anything in yet. So uh, if you get phone calls and stuff like that, that's what it is. Just give me either a paper or a first test. Uh, in fact, have you gotten the second test yet? No. Okay. So please get the first one in because you already got the second one. Oh, you did. Okay, you're in good shape then. Okay. I was uh, not remembering correctly because I remember. It was two guys, not, the, not you. Okay. So let me give you the second test if I can find it. Okay, I'm close. No cigars. Now, do you need graph paper? Because you will need graph paper for this one. Do you need graph paper? Yes. Okay. I need to find it. I had it here, but I think I gave them all out. So, huh? No, I've got some more, but it's not in that part of the stack. Let me find it. So I'll have to make me some, get me some new. Just saw it. Okay, I'm getting closer. Here we go. Now, there are nine to graph, so if you can fit four on one page and five on the other, fine. If not, I can get you more graph paper. I had asked for them to be duplex, and they only ran on simplex, so otherwise that would have been enough. All righty. Okay. The last announcement I was in the process of making 
before Shavak came in and interrupted him. No, no. Was that uh, there is a faculty staff meeting this afternoon from 2.30 to 4.30. doesn't impact this class any, but if you have an afternoon class that fits in some of those times, you might want to either check with your instructor or check on Blackboard to see if there's any adjustment made for your class. And as I was saying before, adjunct instructors aren't required to go, so if you have an adjunct instructor, probably your class is meeting as normal. If you have a full-time instructor, you might want to check and see if either the class will be postponed or delayed or end early or something like that. I have a class this afternoon, but it's a mini-term class, so I wrote and asked permission to meet my class, and I was given that. So not even if you have a full-time instructor, it may not impact the class any at all. Okay. So any questions, anything we've done up to now? You did get, both of y'all got copies of the second test, right? Yeah. The second test covers 4, 5 to 4, 9. No, 4, four 5 to 4, 8. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Yeah, the last four sections. Are. We'll have one on chapter 5 and hopefully one on chapter 6 and then a comprehensive final. Yeah. But we've got to move along. <laughs> okay. So, what we're doing here, any questions before we get started on today? What chapter 5 is dealing with is analytic geometry, uh, trigonometry, which basically is manipulating trig functions. Based. That comes pretty close to it. And what 5.1 is using trigonometric identical, uh, uh, your fundamental identities. And here is example 7. It says rewrite this trigonometric expression so that it is not in a fractional form. So, what's one thing you're going to have to do? Yeah, get rid of that. If it's not in a fraction, you've got to get rid of your denominator. Okay. So, how might we get rid of that denominator? 1 plus sine Get my pen situated here. Okay. You say multiply it by something? Sounds like a good idea. 1 over 1 plus sine x. Okay. Let me give you a hint, and you probably have already done this sometime in your past. Okay? Okay. Uh, and you probably were hoping when you had done it you wouldn't have to ever do it again. But, yeah, you do. Math repeats itself. All right, and this will always work, but if you're trying to clear a denominator, usually a good idea is to multiply by its conjugate. Okay? What is its conjugate? Do you remember? Say again? Say for this one, 1 plus sine x, what would be its conjugate? And this may not work in this case, but we're going to try it. Say again. 1 minus sine x, yes, okay. We did this with irrational numbers, remember. And if you've ever done anything with complex numbers, you do it with that. Complex conjugates. But you can do it with anything, because what does that produce for you? Oh, but if you multiply the denominator by that, what must we also do? Multiply the numerator by that as well. Otherwise, we've changed the expression, right? We change how it looks, but by multiplying by 1, we haven't changed its value. All right. Now, what does that denominator become? And this is why we did it. One, say again. 1 plus sine x minus sine x. So, that, yeah, 1 minus sine squared x. And in the numerator, we have 1 minus sine x, right? Okay. Now, we did that because the conjugate multiplied by itself gives you ability to keep perfect squared. 
And I especially like that from the heart. Let's see. Name of this section. Using. Look at the book. Fundamental what? Identities. Does that look anything like an identity that you may have seen somewhere in the past? Okay. And what was my little hint to you? If you saw squares in there, what should you think? Pythagorean identities, okay? Does that look sort of like any one of those? Which? Name the most famous, the one you use all the time of Pythagorean identities. The simplest one. You sure should know it. Get to know them. It has a sine squared in it. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x is always one. You should know that, right? Yes. Okay. Now, all you have to do is to get this to look like that is subtract a sine squared x from both sides. Okay, this goes away. And you're left with cosine squared x is equal to 1 minus sine squared x. So what you can do now is write this as 1 minus sine x over cosine squared x. Right? Pythagorean identity got you there. You still got a denominator though, right? That's kind of a big boo hiss, isn't it? All it says is rewrite it so it's not in fractional form. Well, guess what you can do? You can split that fraction into 1 over cosine squared x minus sine x over cosine squared x. Right? That's the same form, isn't it? Same thing. You just went from a common denominator to two denominators. So they're the same value, right? What's that? One minus sine squared. And that's what your denominator was here. That's why we multiplied by the conjugate to get you this. And then that becomes cosine squared. So this is equal to that. Right? And this is that. So this is cosine squared x, right? Now that you have a monomial in your denominator, you can split your numerator. 1 over cosine squared x minus sine x over cosine squared x. Right? Now, the question is, can we rewrite this not in fractional? Anytime you see a 1 over, what should you think? What kind of, what's the name of this section? Using the fundamental identities. Which identities would have a 1 over something? What's 1 over something called? Reciprocal identities. And what's a reciprocal identity for 1 over cosine? Get to know them. What's 1 over cosine? Say again? I thought I heard someone say it. I think it was. No. Uh, okay, flip back a few pages, like one page. Fundamental trigonometric identities. And the first subtype there is reciprocal identities. And 1 over cosine is secant. But this is cosine squared, so that would be secant squared x, right? With no denominator, okay? Minus, now I'm going to split your denominator here again. I'm going to write this as sine x over cosine x 
times 1 over cosine x. Is that a legal move? Sine is starting times 1 over cosine x. Yeah. Yeah. So that's legal, right? And here's Kamari, I think. I, I know I recognize him from somewhere. I can't remember where I've seen him before. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it was a joke. Okay. Earth to Tyler, Earth to Tyler, go to employees. Okay. All right. Now. And I said this when others came in, so let me make sure I say it here too. Um, I've been warning the class, in fact all my classes, for a couple of weeks, maybe more than two weeks, that supposedly at midterm, or after midterm, we were supposed to submit midterm progress reports. That's on the academic calendar. Well, um, they never opened it, so I wasn't worrying about it until this week about a week, a week and a half late, the dean said, oh, midterm progress reports are due. So I had to turn in midterm progress report, which was letting uh, them know anyone who was made a D or, making a D or an F at midterm, less than a C at midterm, and if I didn't have anything turned in, I couldn't say that you were passing. So. Just to let you know, if the shoe fits, you might be expecting formula. Okay. When's it due? Monday. Monday. Okay, do I, do I give it to you or? Yeah, you have to sign it too. So. Okay. Uh, where are you going to be later today? Here on campus or somewhere else? I can get. I'll be on Birmingham campus tomorrow. Tomorrow I'll see you Birmingham campus. Okay, okay. You know where Dr. Pruitt's office is? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, my office is in the back behind the, the secretary's desk there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. So, I think I got both of you marked here. EJ. All right. What's that? Uh, we were asked to turn them in, so I turned them in last night. Uh, I'm sure they will Trying to recall, but I think. Yeah, you had turned in for the first test, so you're okay. Yeah, you just turned it in, but I got the email after you turned that in. All right, the question here, rewrite 1 over 1 plus sine x so that it's not in fractional form, which means no denominator, right? So the first thing we did, since we can't just erase the denominator, we multiplied the denominator by its conjugate. It will always work, but it's usually a pretty good step to do. So multiplying by its conjugate, the denominator, we also have to multiply the numerator by the conjugate the denominator too. So that made the numerator more complicated, also the denominator too, except now we have a difference of two person squared. And when that involves a sine or a cosine, that's particularly nice to have because of the Pythagorean identity that one minus sine squared x is cosine squared x. So now to put that in its place, well now that we have that in its place, we can split the numerator over that denominator, so that's 1 over cosine squared x minus sine over cosine squared x. 1 over cosine squared x plus secant squared x, that's not in fractional form. But these two still are. What I did here was split sine into sine times 1, and cosine squared into cosine times cosine. So this will be sine x over cosine x times 1 over cosine x. What is sine x over cosine x? Fundamental identities. 
racial identity, or they call them quotient identity. Flip back a page. What is sign of the cosine? You ought to know these by now. Tangent. So we can rewrite this to be secant squared x minus tangent x. How about 1 over cosine? What's that? Secant. Secant x. We only had it like three minutes ago, okay? It was a long time, I admit that, okay? So, we now have written this expression, so it's not in fractional form. It's fairly complicated looking, but not bad. It still has no fraction. Does that make sense? Now, there are other ways you could write this, like factor out a secant. Now, secant x times secant x minus tangent x, that would be fine too. But that no better than this. So. Let's see how they did it. Any questions on that for it? Yeah. Any questions for the result? I'll give you time to get it down. Get to know these identities, folks. Save yourself a lot of grief. Now, I can almost hear somebody saying in the back of their mind, do we have to memorize these? I hate memorization. But you know what? I can never remember memorizing my name. Did y'all have to memorize your name? Maybe your Landria. No, I'm sorry. She just came in. Okay. No. You used it enough, you knew it. Just like your combination lot. If you use it a lot, you don't think, no, I memorized it. Maybe at first you did. But when you use it, you get to know it, right? That's what you need to do with these. I'm taking this, and I may be taking it all wrong here, because I'm not getting a really rapid response when I ask what some of these things are. But maybe you haven't used them enough. Maybe could that be the case. Meaning, maybe you haven't done too many homework exercises. Maybe. Possibly. Potentially. Nah, that couldn't be it. Okay. Must be something else. Memory lapse. Okay. Anyway, any questions on this? Everybody got it? Okay. Okay. This is secant squared x from here. 1 over cosine squared is secant squared. That's your reciprocal identity, squared. And here we have sine x over cosine x. That's tangent x. Quotient identity is what I call the ratio identity. And then 1 over cosine again. So you've gotten rid of the denominators. They're no longer in fractional form. Right? All right. That's what you, you get something out of fraction form. Lose the denominators. Okay. Any more questions on that for our racing? Okay. Let's see how they did it. From the Pythagorean identity, boy, they went around this a really bizarre way, but it's right. Cosine squared x is 1 minus sine squared x. Yeah, that's what I would think when I first looked at that problem. Uh, but sine squared, 1 minus sine squared x is minus 1 minus sine x times 1 minus 1 plus sine x. Yeah, right. Multiplying both numerator and denominator by 1 minus sine x. Sure enough, that's where I would have started. Use multiplied by the by the conjugate. That's usually when you're trying to get rid of the denominators. Try it. May not work, but try it. And that's what we did. And indeed, doing that gets us to here. If you multiply the denominator by one minus cosine minus one minus sine x, you have to multiply the numerator by that as well. Okay. So that gives you one minus sine x over one minus sine squared x, okay? Now, 1 minus sine squared x from your Pythagorean identity is cosine squared x. So that's 1 minus sine x over cosine squared x, Pythagorean identity. Then split that into pieces. 1 over cosine squared x minus sine x over cosine squared x. It's like 
adding or subtracting fractions in reverse. If you had the two things with common denominators, keep the denominator, subtract the numerator. This time you have the numerator, split it into two fractions with this common denominator. That's what we did. Now the 1 minus cosine squared x, we recognize by a reciprocal identity, is that it's, uh, well, no, they didn't do it. They first did the product of the two fractions, sine x times 1 over cosine x times co cosine x, that be sine x over cosine x times 1 over cosine x. Now we use the reciprocal and the quotient identity. Reciprocal identity here, 1 over cosine secant, or cosine squared over secant squared, uh, minus sine over cosine tangent, that's the quotient identity, I call it ratio identity, 1 over cosine and secant, just like we did here, the rest is the first time. There you've got it. No longer in fractional form. That's all you were gunning for, okay? There's also a checkpoint here. Just my suspicion is probably some of you need to do the checkpoint. It was like pulling teeth getting that one out, okay? And I'm not a dentist, okay? So, any questions before we move on? Moving on, we lost everything. That means they didn't do examples 8 and 9. So let's us do 8 and 9. Now they tell you a substitution to make. It's a good one, but they just pull it out of the air or some unmentionable body part, okay? Use the substitution x equal 2 tangent theta. Ooh, where did that come from? Now this is good only when 0 is less than or equal to no, less than theta. They don't include the equality, though there's no reason not to, but they didn't. Less than theta, and that's less than pi halves. There is a good reason they didn't put an equality there. Okay? Now, what does this tell you right here? As in, where are you, Waldo? And you're in the first quadrant. This restricts to the first quadrant, from here to there. Not the axis here, not the axis here. You could have included the axis here, no sweat. I said you can't include that one. No, no. If, why couldn't you put an equal sign here for pi halves? Tangent is not defined at pi half, remember? Vertical asymptote there. Right? Okay? Because tangent is sine over cosine, and cosine is what? Pi half. Cosine pi half. Zero! And you can never divide by zero. So you can't use pi half. You could have used zero for the first part, because tangent is fine there, zero, but you can't use the pi half one. Okay, so that's part of the problem. So use that substitution to write this thing. The square root of 4 plus x squared as a trigonometric function of theta. Okay, so this is what we're going to deal with here. Well, they told us the substitution to make, x equal 2 tangent theta. So what's the first thing you've got to do to that x to make it look like the x over here? Square it. So what is x squared? Four tangent squared theta. Okay, so let's plug that in. So this becomes the square root of 4 plus, and x squared is 4 tangent squared theta. Got it? Now, what does it look like you might be able to factor out there? A 4. 
Okay, so that's going to be the square root of 4 times what would be left? 1 plus tangent squared theta. Okay, now guess what? I can now rewrite this as the square root of 4 times the square root of 1 plus tangent squared theta. What's the square root of 4? 2. Now that started with the square root, principal square root, so we're going to leave that positive. Okay. How about this 1 plus tangent squared theta? Ah, have I seen that somewhere before? What's that? Want well, to know your fundamental identities? Which one? Which one? The square. Square, yeah. When you see the square, think Pythagorean, and they always are squared. So that is the square root of secant squared theta. But guess what? What's the square root of secant squared theta? Second? Secant theta. So this is 2 times secant theta. Now, remember we restricted the theta to be in the first quadrant where everything is positive. That's why we restricted that. Because if we had included, we couldn't go any further that way because the tangent wasn't confined there. But if we went this way, actually we'd have been okay too because secant would have, though it is, secant would have been negative. Which would have still been okay, uh, but it's just handier to see it like that. So that is our example A, and that's what the book got good for them. That's as long as theta is between zero and pi halves, so that means secret theta is greater than zero. In fact, okay, do you notice there in the book where they say secret is greater than zero? They could have done better than that. What could they have said? Secret theta is greater than 1. Because secret is never between 0 and 1, remember? In fact, it's never between minus 1 and 1. So they could have said secret theta is greater than 1 for 0 less than theta is less than pi halves. Okay? If they had included an equal for the 0, for theta equals 0, then you would have said greater than or equal to 1. But they didn't, so it's greater than Looks like another good checkpoint to do. Okay? Now, you might ask, which I'm doubting you did, but you might ask, well, where did they get that substitution anyway? Okay? If they were trying to solve this thing here, why would they think of a substitution like that? Well, here's sort of why. Okay? What does that look like to you? This expression right here. I'm going to give you a hint. Okay. How would that relate to the Pythagorean theorem? Second? What is the Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So if you took the square root of both sides of that, you'd have C is equal to the square root of A squared plus B squared. Square root of A squared plus B squared. Guess what? That basically is defining a triangle for you. Remember, we already said it has to be in the first quadrant. So let's get in the first quadrant here and have which you want A to be the adjacent or opposite. I don't care. Second, the opposite? Okay. So we'll have the 2 here, because 2 squared is 4, and this will be x here, and this will be the square root of 4 plus x squared. Wouldn't it? The hypotenuse would be the, the square root of x squared plus 2 squared, which is 4 plus x squared. Right? And if this is your angle theta here, between 0 and pi halves, that's fine, then 
we could say that tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, 2 over x, right? Yeah. Okay. Then multiply both sides by only less. Yeah. Okay. So I don't like your choice. <laughs> Sorry. We could have we could have done this. This is how I wanted to do it anyway. But I went by what you said. I got into trouble, didn't I? Okay, make this the x and this the two. You want it opposite, I want it adjacent. Okay. It doesn't real it does matter here. So this now will be x over two. Right? Do you buy that? Tangent theta is x over 2, opposite over adjacent, right? Then multiply both sides of that equation by 2. x is equal to 2 tangent theta. That's where it came from. And you could do that. That fits like a glove. Yeah. Okay, that's just telling you why they did that. Okay, now let's move to example nine. So, what I'm going to do is erase everything. Everybody got this one? You need it any longer? Okay. Okay. Let's do example nine. Rewrite this. The natural log, oh yay, okay, of the absolute value of cosecant theta. This looks fun. Plus the natural log of the absolute value of tangent theta is equal to the natural log. No, I'm sorry. Rewrite that as a single logarithm. Sorry. I was looking at the solution, not at the problem. Okay. So. All right. There was your issue. Rewrite this. Natural log of secant, cosecant theta plus natural log of tangent theta. Rewrite that as a single logarithm and simplify the result. Do you remember your rules for logarithms? No. Okay. Let me refresh you on what they are. This is the magic of logarithms. This is the reason we use logarithms. It takes big numbers and makes them manageable. And here's how. If you're multiplying two really big numbers together, you're going to get a really, really, really big number, right? But if you were to take the logarithm of that, you basically make the numbers smaller. Okay? And here's the deal with logarithms. The sum of two logs, as long as they have the same base, and these are natural logarithms, so they both have base of E, is equal to the product of their, the log of their products. That's what logarithms do. You can take two big numbers, multiply them together, you get a really big number. But if you take the log of everything, the log of one times plus the log of the other is the same as the log of the product of the two, and the log of the product of the two is a much more manageable number. So the log sort of tone things down a little bit. So the rule for log, and by the way, if you don't know these already, go to, okay, thought it was in here. It kind of is. Yeah. 
Well, it is, but it's not where I was hoping it would be. Not inside the front and back cover. Okay, so what you do now is go back to chapter 3, which the book is assuming you've already had, and not always do we get to get to chapter 3 or uh, all the way through it in uh, Math 112. I know I don't always get there. I always try to, but we don't, okay? 3.1 is exponential functions. 3.2 is logarithmic functions. I was hoping they'd have it there. Logarithmic functions and their graphs. Okay? And turn, 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 turn. Well, wait. It's 3.3. .3. Properties of logarithms. Should have turned there to begin with. Okay? Here it is. Page 222. Chapter 3, Section 3.3, .3. and by the way, a little historical note there, John Napier, Scottish mathematician. Thank you, John. He's the one that gave us these, okay? Uh, he promoted them big time anyway. Here's the product property. Look under number one, the property to logarithm, natural logarithm. Log of uv is log u plus uv. The log of a product is the sum of the logs. That's the thing to remember. So in this one, we got the sum of two logs. So that means that's the same as the natural log of the products. Cosecant theta times tangent theta. That's the property of logarithms. It's mentioning, okay? Get to know them too, folks, okay? So it says use... Rewrite that and simplify the result. So we've rewritten that uh, as a single logarithm. That's the first step. Now simplify the results. Okay? Well, how is that going to simplify? We're going to use another principle of logarithm. Maybe. What is cosecant, by the way? What is cosecant? Okay, y'all haven't gotten to know these things too well, have you? One over sine. And we'll put that in absolute values too. And what is tangent theta? Sine over cosine. Okay. That's the theta. Okay. Well, guess what? The signs will go out. These are absolute values here. That's fine. Okay, the signs go out, and what you have now is the logarithm of 1 over cosine theta. But what's 1 over cosine theta? A little louder. Secant. So this is the log of secant theta. And we'll put the absolute values there. And that's exactly what we got. So you use one principle of logarithm, two principles of trig identities, and another trig identity, and you got it done. Okay. There is a checkpoint there. Not a bad idea to do those. Last, that ends 5.1. Let's do vocabulary. I think we really need some of these vocabulary. Number one, what's sine u over cosine u? Tangent u, very good. Number two, one over cosecant u. Sine u, what is uh, one over tangent u? Say again. Cotangent u, very good. What is secant of pi halves minus u? Cosecant of u, excellent. What is one plus blank? Equal cosecant squared u. Cotangent squared u, excellent. And what is cotangent of negative u? Negative cotangent u because it's an odd function. Okay, I thought it was pretty odd. Okay, that's your uh, vocabulary. Let's do the homework exercises. 
Hint, let's do the homework exercises. I'm not blowing breath here. I want you to do these. Any of the odds 7 through 13? Any of the odds 15 through 19? Any of the odds 21 to 27? Either 29 or 31 or both? Do 33, the only one like that. Do any of the odds 35 to 43? Either 45 or 47 or both? Do 49, the only one like that has an answer in the back. Okay? Do 51, the only one that has an answer in the back. Do either 53 or 55 or both? Do 57. Do 59. Do either 61 or 63 or both. Those are the ones like we just did. And then there is a applied problem number 65. So I would definitely try to do that. Uh, exploration is one true false that has, should have the answer in the back. Okay. And then there's uh, finding some limits of trigonometric functions. Not bad to think through that one. Uh, 69 and or 71 and, and or 73. And then think about 75. You don't have to do anything too drastic on that. But you have to. All right, any questions? Okay, that finishes 5.1. All right, whoa, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's go to 5.2. Taking a while for the PowerPoint to load. Number in 5.1, we basically focus on the fundamental identities. 5.2, we're going to be using them like crazy. So get to know them, okay? Big time. You're going to use them over and over and over again, okay? And this section is called Verifying Trigonometric Identities. They're going to give you something they say is true. You have to verify it is true. Okay? And we'll talk about a few techniques. The objective here, to verify trigonometric identities. Period. That's it. That's all, folks. That's what this whole section is on, verifying these identities. Now, they start by a couple of definitions here. In this section, you'll study techniques for verifying trig identities. They've said it about three times now. Remember that a conditional equation is an equation that is true only for some of the values in its domain. Not always true. Okay? And that's what you're usually trying to find for what values is true. Like sine x equals zero. Where is sine x equals zero? Give me a few questions. What values for x would make that true? x equals zero. Any others? Whole number line doesn't work there. In the other place, sine x is equal to zero. Second, x equal one. Okay. All right. Here, think about it this way. Sine x is what is the x y r definition of sine x? X, Y's, and R's. What is sine x? These to me are the easiest ones to remember. They're the ones that are, have the most power to them, that you use them the most. Y over R, you're absolutely right. Sine is always Y over R. Okay, where is Y zero? At zero. And at time, right? Or 180 degrees. Or at 2 pi, 3 pi, 4 pi, 5 pi, or negative pi, negative 2 pi, negative 3 pi, negative 4 pi. So it's all your n pi. That's where sine.
find that to be zero. That's a conditional equation. It's only true if x is one of those n types. If x is pi hat, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be one. If it's x is anything other than a whole number pi, it's never going to be zero. Okay? But at all the whole number pi's, it will always be zero. So n is any energy. When you find those values, you're solving the equation. Okay, that's what we do a lot in math. But what we're doing in this section is verifying identity. What is an identity? On the other hand, uh, an equation that is true for all real values in the domain of a variable is called an identity. Can anyone think of an identity? The fundamental identities. Name one of them. You had a whole page of them. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x. Always equal to 1. No matter what x value you put in there, it's always equal. That's an identity. It's not a conditional equation. It's an identity. Also, sine squared x is 1 minus cosine squared x. Sine x is 1 over cosecant x. That's always true. Those are identities. True for all real numbers x's. Okay? At least this one is. What I just gave you. Most of the time is. Okay. But these are your identities. Anything that's always true. An equation, conditional equation, that's only good for certain values. These are good for any value. All right. So what we're going to be doing is verifying trigonometric identities and although there are similarities, verifying that a trigonometric equation is an identity is quite different from solving an equation. I'll point out the major reason. There is no well-defined set of rules to follow in verifying trigonometric identities. It is best to learn the process by practicing. Okay? Seems like things we have not done too well. Okay? So here are some of the guidelines, and I'll tell you some of these I agree with and some I disagree with, okay? They say work with one side of the equation at a time. It is often better to work with the more complicated side first. Not necessary. You can work with both sides at the same time. How I say this is just don't cross the equal sign. Don't do something to both sides. Do the work at them separately. I mean, so it says one at a time. You can work at them at the same time, but just don't cross the equal sign. Okay? So I sort of don't agree with that one too well. It is a good idea to focus on the complicated side. Okay? And if the uncomplicated side is very simple, don't change it. Keep it simple. Okay, now, look for opportunities to factor an expression. That's how we started section 5.1, right? We started off with fractions. Or, if you have fractions there, they need to be added or subtracted, try that. Square binomial, okay, it's a little tougher to do. You have to be careful with it, but you should. Or create a monomial denominator. Guess what? We did that. That last, that first example we did today had a one plus sign in your denominator. We were trying to get rid of that, so we multiplied by its conjugate, so we could come up with a monomial denominator. So those are just some little tricks to do. Look at your problem, see if you can think of anything that could simplify. One side or the other, just don't cross the equal sign. Look for opportunities. To use the fundamental identities. I said we're going to use them and use them and use them. We are. Note which functions are in the final expression you want. And here's what I did. Sines and cosines pair up well. Secants and tangents pair up well. Cosecants and cotangents pair up well. How do they pair up? Why do they say they pair up well? Which fundamental identity? Pair up sines and cosines. See? Yeah, you're. What did you say? Okay, they do other things. Reciprocal identities paired up the sine with the cosecant. 
turns up with a cosine with a secant and tangent with cocant. But what pairs up sines and cosines? Secants and tangents and cosecants and so cocant. Oh! Your what? Which identities? Hint, they always have squares in them. Pythagorean identities, okay? So it, it says that. Look for opportunities using fundamental identities. And what I was saying before, it still holds. If you have some squares in there, see if there's a way to use Pythagorean identities. If you have reciprocals in there, do that. Okay. If the preceding guidelines do not help, try converting all the terms to sines and cosines. You know what? I usually don't wait this far down. I look at the problem and something pops out at me. You something simple to simplify, adding fractions, you know, anything that pops out. Oh, beg me, please do this. Do it. Okay? But if nothing pops out, and if I see a bunch of squares, then I'll use some identity, you know, Pythagorean identity. But if nothing pops out at me, this is where I go. Get everything in terms of sines and cosines. Okay. Always try something. Even if the thing you're trying isn't going to help you any, it might say, oh, but this might do. You might think of something else in the process of doing that. So always try something. Even making any attempt that leads to a dead end might give you insight and say, oh, yeah, but this didn't help, then what if I did it this way? Okay. Now, Verifying the trigonometric identities is a useful process when you need to convert a trigonometric expression into a form that is more useful algebraically. That's what we're getting at, trying to solve problems. When you verify an identity, you cannot assume that the two sides of the equation are equal because that's what you're trying to verify, they're equal. So don't ever assume they are. That's why you can't add the same thing to both sides. You, know, you don't want to do that. You Treat each side separately and see if you can get them to be the same. As a result, when verifying identities, you cannot use operations such as adding the same quantity to each side or cross multiplication or setting up a proportion or, or anything that crosses the equal sign. Don't do it, okay? Uh, work with one side and or the other side. Try to get them to the same point, okay? So here's one. Verify this identity that sine, secant squared theta minus 1 over secant squared theta is sine squared theta. Now, we don't know that that's true. We're guessing. They're saying verify it, so we're taking their word for it that it is true. So what I usually do is put a question mark there. I don't know if that's true or not until I verify it. Okay. Now, looking at these two sides, which one looks more complicated? Left or right? By far. The right-hand side is already in terms of sine squared. I like sine squared. So I'm not going to do anything to mess it up unless I have to. Okay? But I'm sure going to try to think of something to do with the left-hand side. And does anything pop out at you right at the beginning? Say again? Multiply what? Say again? Okay. I hope this is what you mean. Uh, I don't think this might be the best way, but I think it certainly will work. Okay. It's sort of like we did before. Once you have a monomial denominator with a sum or a difference in the numerator, split it up. So you could do this. Secret squared theta over secret squared theta minus 1 over secant squared theta. Okay? That is a legitimate thing to do. Like I said, I don't think it's the best. And I'm trying to tie into what you said because that does simplify the yield. What does that become? 1. You're absolutely right. That becomes 1. And what is this one? 1 over secant squared. What? 1 over secant squared. That looks a lot like a... Oh, 
Oh, yeah. What is it? It's a... What is it again? It's a reciprocal. Just slapping you there, it's a reciprocal. What's it the reciprocal of? Secret squared is the reciprocal of what? 1 over secret is cosine. So this would be cosine squared. And guess what 1 minus cosine squared is? Say again. <laughs> okay, when you see the squares, what kind of identities do you want to think of? Pythagorean, and what's your fundamental, the base, most basic Pythagorean identity? We've only said it two or three times a day. Sine squared theta. More of it. Huh? Plus cosine squared theta is always equal to one, fundamental identity. Okay, now. How could you manipulate that to make it look sort of like this? Subtract cosine squared from both sides. Now, you can do that to your identity. You can't do it to this. You can do it to this thing you know, cosine squared theta. Okay, and what does that give you? Is equal to... Yes, that, that's a Pythagorean identity. That is equal to sine squared theta. No more question mark there. There it is. Now, that way certainly worked. Okay? I think what they were looking for, and again, my suggestion to you, when you see the squares, look for what? Pythagorean. And if you look back at your Pythagorean identities you would have seen there's also one that says something like this. Tangent squared theta plus 1 equal secant squared theta, right? So if you subtract 1 from both sides, then you get tangent squared theta is equal to secant squared theta minus 1, which is exactly what you have in your numerator there, right? So you then could have gone, this is tangent squared theta. I don't have much room. Tangent squared theta over secant squared theta. The question is, is that equal to sine squared theta? We don't know that yet. So guess what I'm going to do next? Can I run out of other options? Get everything in terms of. Fourth thing, I said I do it much earlier than that. I think it's a handy little rule to do. Take care of what you can deal with, that's obvious to you, but then get everything in terms of sines and cosines. And what's tangent squared in terms of sine and cosine? What's tangent? This is sine squared theta over cosine squared theta. And your secant squared theta is what? No, 1 over, not sine squared, that's cosecant squared. Cosine squared. And guess what? Multiplying numerator and denominator by cosine squared, those divide away, and now you have sine squared theta equals sine squared theta. Yep, right there. So there's several ways you can do these. I just gathered from what I thought I heard Kumari saying, one way to cancel those things out, split them up and then cancel out your secret squared in one of the terms. So there's several ways to get there. Both of those ways got work. Okay? Let's see which one the book used. Okay? They started with, they re, oh my, oh, okay, goodness gracious. Now, they did it weirdly, I admit, okay, but it works. 
They said from your Pythagorean identity, 46 squared theta is 10 to the square root theta plus 1. Okay, that's one way to do it. I started with this one that that's equal to that and then subtracted one from both sides and got the same thing. They got it this way, it's fine. 2 to the square root theta is 10 to the square root theta plus 1. So it's 10 to the square root theta plus 1 minus 1. Plus 1 minus 1 adds to 0. And that gives us what we got. The second way we did it is 10 to the square root theta over secant square root theta. Now get everything in terms of sines and cosines. Oh boy, did they ever come up with a weird way to do it. Secant square root theta is 1 over cosine square root theta, so they put it that way. Then they did tangent square root theta is sine square root theta over cosine square root theta. Cosines cancel out. And sure enough, you're left with secret, or sine square root theta on the left-hand side and sine square root theta on the right-hand side. Notice that to verify, you verify the identity by starting with the left side of the equation, more complicated side, using the fundamental tri trigonometric identity to simplify it until you obtain the right-hand side. In this problem, you did because the right-hand side was so simple, there's nothing you could do to simplify it any further. So you only work with the left-hand side. As you'll see, there are others you'll deal with both sides. Okay? I think you can hear what I'm going to say next. Here's a checkpoint. Do your checkpoints. Otherwise, all this is for naught. Okay? If you don't go back, oh goodness, look at that. They did one example and that's all, folks. Okay, so let's do a few more. Don't you think? All right. Okay, let's do example two. Verify the identity that sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta times secant squared theta is equal to 1. Where would you begin? Left hand side, right hand side, both what? Yeah, let's go with the left. I mean, 1. How can you get simpler than that? Okay, so we're not going to mess with the one. So what might we do on the left? Anything pop out at you? Say again? What about the top part? That's equal to one. Yeah, fundamental identity. Pythagorean identity, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is one. So now we have one over cosine squared theta times secant squared theta. And now supposedly, we don't know this is equal to 1. That's what we're trying to verify. So where would it go from here? So that one's pretty obvious. Pythagorean identity, we can write it down. What would we do here? What's my favorite little rule? Put everything in terms of sines and cosines. We already got cosines, so all we have to do is get that secant squared in terms of either sines or cosines. So this is 1 over cosine squared theta. And what is secant squared theta in terms of sines or cosines? What is secant squared theta? Say again? 1 over cosine squared theta. You, you nailed it. And guess what? Cosine squared theta over cosine squared theta is 1. 1 over 1 is 1. It checks. Right? That one's pretty easy. Just right there. Okay? Y'all need that any longer? Or can I go on and uh, clear it? Clear it? All right. Okay, let's try number three. Verifying another one.
by the way, on the right hand side, well, on page uh, 359, they have several other alternative expressions for your Pythagorean identities, which I think I did for you the first time they were mentioned, and I've done them several times since then. A lot of different ways to express those, okay? So, let's do number example three. Verify this identity. Tangent squared theta. No, x. Sorry about that. Sometimes they use x, sometimes they use theta. It doesn't really matter. It's just sort of a dummy variable. Tangent squared x plus 1 times cos cosine squared x minus 1. The question is, is that equal to negative tangent squared x? Okay. There's our question. Second. This is example three. Page 359. Tangent squared x plus one times cosine squared x minus one is equal to negative tangent squared x. Or at least that's what we're trying to show. All right. Where would you begin? Right side? Not a bad choice. I would do both sides because they're not all in terms of sines and cosines. But the left-hand side really is more complicated, so I'm really wanting to focus on that. Now, anything pretty obvious about the left-hand side? Okay. Anything look familiar? Guess what? When you see the squares, say again. Anyone have something? When you see squares, think what? Pythagorean identities. Do any of those look fairly close to a Pythagorean identity? Tangent squared theta uh, x plus 1 is exactly secant squared theta. You got it. Okay, there's one simplification. Okay, how about cosine squared theta minus 1? It's not 1 directly, but it's... It's, it's a negative what? Uh-uh. Sine squared. Uh, and those are x's, not thetas. I keep wanting to put thetas in here. Okay. Now... Uh, and I sort of agree with Tyler a little bit here. I think we can simplify. I don't want to get too carried away here. With tangent squared theta, how might that simplify? Does that make it simpler? I don't think so. Yes, yeah, sine squared theta or x over cosine squared x. I like it because it gets everything in terms of sines and cosines. Because guess what the next thing I'm going to suggest that you do on the left-hand side? Yeah, secant squared theta, what is it? That's 1 over cosine squared, right? And 1 over cosine squared x times minus sine squared x is indeed minus sine squared x over cosine squared x, isn't it? Done! Okay. I know. Piece of cake, right? Once you know those identities, okay? Required to know the identities. Okay. I've got some sad news for you. We've run out of time. Oh, no! Yuck! Okay. But we made decent progress. We are on page 359. We'll start next time with example four. Okay? Homework exercises in this section will include start on some of the odds 9 through 49. There's a whole passel of them there. 
You may not be able to do them all. In fact, I'd say maybe go no further than 45, but you might even find some of those more difficult. So uh, do what you can of those. Good deal. Any questions? Have a good weekend. We'll see you Tuesday.